Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege it is to study your word together. I thank you for just all the teachers who love you and who love the men and women and children here, putting the time in to prepare and to care for them. Uh, Father, would you even now open our eyes to see more of the beauty of your word, to see your son Jesus as God, the son of God, the Christ, in this passage today. We love you, Father, because you first loved us. We pray and ask all this in your son Jesus' name. So as you can see in Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 35, just a short introduction. What do you do when you hear bad news? Or even the worst of news? Can you think back to news that you had heard that really changed your life? For me, the first one was back in 2016 when in the winter time, I got a call from my mom telling me that uh, her mom, my gr grandmother, was in a coma and was going to die in a few days. That was devastating news to me because at the time, I, I knew that she wasn't a Christian. I knew also that I'd wasted so many years of my life just playing video games every day that I did not take the time I could have to tell her about Jesus Christ, tell her more in the times that I spent with her. So my prayer that when I heard that was, God, please, could I have one last chance to say goodbye to her, to share one more time about the Bible, about who you are? And God gave the opportunity. I was able to fly back to Taiwan to go to, uh, and the Lord extended her life for another week and a half. So I got to be by her side every day. Of course, my prayer too was perhaps the Lord would heal her, that she would get up from her coma and be able to, in a sense, come back to life again. But that was not God's uh, will. But he did give the opportunity every day to be by her side, to share the gospel over and over and over again, one last time. So what about you? When was the last time you heard this kind of bad news? And as we enter this passage, here's a ruler, synagogue ruler, hearing probably the worst news he's ever heard in his life. Your daughter has died. So let's look in verse 35. The first point, verse 35 to 36, is what does life look like from man's point of view? Man's point of view. While Jesus is still speaking, and this could have been hours already in talking to the bleeding woman, they came from the house of the synagogue official. They, this is probably close relatives. Servants wouldn't be ordering their boss around. This would probably be close relatives of Jairus saying, your daughter has died. What you came to ask Jesus to do is no longer needed because she is dead. Why trouble the teacher anymore? Think about that, that question. It's, it's, we might see it as, oh, these people don't have faith. But up to this point in the Bible, in Mark, no one has ever been raised from the dead. This is a normal conclusion to come to. Perhaps while the patient is sick, the doctor could do something. But when they're dead, there's nothing left to be done. It's over. But it, uh, they, it could also be the... Uh, at this point, why did they come to Jairus and not wait till he got to the house? Remember, Jesus in this time, after a year and a half of his ministry, he, the Jewish religious leaders were becoming enemies of Jesus. They hated him because he was saying he is God. They see that as wrong. And he was also calling out all their wrong teaching, all their hypocrisy, which they also did not like. They perhaps wanted Jairus, hey, don't associate with this Jesus. Uh, just don't let him come to the house. Like, it's over. Just come back, and you can still keep your synagogue position. You can still be the respected synagogue leader. At this point, if Jairus associates with Jesus, he is likely to lose everything that he has in the synagogue. But Jesus, overhearing all these things, what had been spoken, said to the synagogue ruler, do not be afraid, only believe. When you go through a tragedy, when you're at a funeral, when a friend says to you, oh, you know, everything will be all right. Or, uh, we talked about this on Zoom. There's a movie back then called Lion King. Have you heard of Haku Manata? How do you say it? <laughs> and the kids will say it right. What does it mean? No worries. It means no worries for the rest of your days. See, that kind of phrase by itself would be useless. It would almost be like, yeah, they're in a better place now, but based on what? Based on what truth? It will be all right based on what truth. But remember, who's the one speaking here? Jesus himself. Do not be afraid, only believe. And this only happened moments after, uh, minutes, hours after Jesus healed this 
bleeding woman. So that was, that's almost like a glimpse of hope for Jairus. The same faith that you came to me to heal your daughter, keep believing because I, uh, do not be afraid, only believe. Then uh, we can move on to verse 37. The first point is man's point of view. It seems everything is hopeless. But then Jesus steps in and we see things now from Jesus' point of view. In verse 37, and he allows no one to accompany him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. He doesn't let anyone else, again, there's a crowd of thousands upon thousands of people. He's not letting one single person come with him. That must have taken quite some time, right? If the rush is to get back to Jairus' house as soon as they can to heal his daughter, this is not the way to do it. But Jesus is, you know those people in the crowd. Uh, I remember this one lady, uh, you know, they were closing the ice cream truck. But she was still arguing for, I want my ice cream. So, <laughs> you can imagine the crowd, how long it took to get every single person to leave and not follow them. Mm. And he, except Peter, James, and John, why these three? We know Jesus as God for his children. He does not play favoritisms in the same way that he commands parents, don't show, play favorites for your children. Because that would cause so much uh, chaos at home for the children. And unhappiness. Jesus also, he chooses these three not because they're better, not because they had more faith. Remember, Peter's the, the guy who seems to speak more than he should. <laughs> Peter and James and John, just to answer that question briefly, uh, Peter is the one who would go on to disciple John Mark. The reason why we could read the Gospel of Mark is because Peter was there as an eyewitness. Uh, he also wrote other epistles, first and second Peter. James, who is he? He would be the first apostle to die for the faith. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is strengthening his faith for what is to come. Mm -hmm. And finally, John, who is he? God used him to write the Gospel of John, to be the last living apostle, to write 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, to write Revelation. Jesus was preparing these three for a special ministry. That's why he spent more time with these three. Mm -hmm. Then in verse 38, they came to the house of the synagogue official, and he saw a commotion, and people loudly crying, crying and wailing. I got to learn something new this past week was or be reminded when we read the Bible we can't read it through an American lens or whatever culture you come from your background we can't read it from a uh, from a Hispanic lens we can't read it from an Asian lens we need to read it again 2,000 years ago what was the Jewish culture like there's a lot of people weeping and wailing here if we if we were to read ourselves into that it would just be a lot of people were sad and yes that's true but in their culture, they would hire specifically professional mourners who would weep and wail to, for the, at the funeral. And by this time, there is a funeral. To think about it, I don't know if you've ever seen a dead body before, but minutes after the person dies and stops breathing, the skin color starts to change mm -hmm. in, the, in the process to, for their body to fall apart starts beginning. The funeral must begin, again, right there. They came, and the funeral was happening. And entering in, Jesus said, Why are you making a commotion and crying? The child has not died, but is asleep. It sounds almost as if, Why did Jesus not just say, She's dead? Uh, again, uh, later on, we would find out Jesus didn't want anyone to know about this. But also, in a sense, Jesus is about to do something uh, where her death, she did die, but it would only be temporary. He would bring her back. Only Jesus can say something like this. Jesus has a different point of view. And only a select few were allowed to go with Jesus to the house at this time. But you and me today, everyone who's hearing these words right now, and even on the recording, we have the privilege of seeing what is about to happen. And the question is, how will you respond? Think about it. You might say, why didn't Jesus let the crowd follow him? What did they believe? Well, the question is, how will you respond to these truths that we're about to read right now? Will you lay down your pride and your sin and your, that you're an enemy of God and confess that you need a Savior? Will you turn to Jesus as your Lord and Savior after tonight, if you haven't already? If not, then in the same way, uh, that's why Jesus did not let the crowd in, because they would not have believed. 
and we see that Jesus is in control of the situation. So what do, what do they say after Jesus says these things? The child is only asleep. Again, if you're really sad at a funeral, you'd probably be just, uh, okay, uh, you know, maybe Jesus just doesn't want to accept reality at this point. But instead, look in verse 40, they began laughing at him. And this is not like a, a funny joke laugh. This is a scornful, judgmental, you don't know what you're talking about. You're crazy kind of a judgmental laugh. Again, remember, at this point, the Jews did not like Jesus, mm. the religious leaders. Uh, they saw him as someone who did all these miracles by the power of demons, by the power of the devil. And they were just scorning at Jesus. But again, remember, Jesus is in control. And he puts them all out, and he only takes along the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child was. And just to apply again that passage, these people are mocking Jesus, and Jesus has authority to even kick them out of their own house. Some of these are probably relatives, uncles and aunts of the little girl. And today, people will ridicule Jesus today. Are you ashamed when people make fun of Jesus about God, about Christianity? Or will you continue forward in faith and, and uh, continue what God has commanded? Think back to Genesis when God commanded Noah to build the ark. It's going to flood. But did you know, at that point in time, they, there was not one single drop of rain. So all the people are laughing at Noah. What do you mean the world's going to flood with water? Like, there's no water anywhere. But Noah, I don't remember how long, but probably... 600 years. 600 years, think about that. We don't even live 600 years anymore today, but Noah spent 600 years day by day faithfully building that ark. He could have thought, I'm... I'm the only guy on the planet making this gigantic boat. Like, we don't even know what a boat is. <laughs> but he continued in faith because he believed in God, his word. What God would do what he said he would. So in the same way, continue believing in Jesus, even when the world is laughing at you. Then we see, finally, that man's faith becomes sight. Verses 41 to 43. Imagine, we're entering this room, entering this house. You're, you're going into that room. I still remember one of the first times I, I lost a, a closer family was an uh, uncle. And we were renting from uh, him and his wife at the time, their house. So entering that room of where he used to sleep, his bedroom, it was a very difficult thing to do, mm. correct? Yeah. It's a very special room to that person. It's a very special room to you because you know that person. You love that person. So they're entering this room. They know where the dead body is. And how difficult must have been for the father and mother, for the disciples too. When they enter that room, what do they see? Do they see lights and happiness and the girl jumping around? No. The first thing they do when they enter that room, they see there she is lying there, motionless, motionless lifeless, dead. Her body, she's probably already turning gray at this point. And yet, what is, what is the first thing Jesus does? This is, this is, it makes no sense. And taking the child by the hand, again, you're imagining this situation. That you have this dead body right here, the daughter's body. Jesus, taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, yeah. which translated means, little girl, I say to you, arise. Jesus takes this, the hand of this, of their daughter's body, raises it up, tells her to stand up, and what happens? Immediately. Life flashes back into her cheeks. Immediately, her eyes open. She starts breathing again. And she stands up in verse 42 and begins even walking around, showing that she is alive. Can you imagine in the split second this happening? It's not like a, okay, let's, let's uh, mm, we, if we pray really hard, something will happen. No, Jesus has the power. And Jesus doesn't even have to pray to the Father. He, he just get up. Because, you know what? And the Bible tells us later on, Jesus created the world, the universe, in Colossians chapter 1. If he could create the universe, he could also give life to his creation. Talitha kum, why, why did he speak in Aramaic? Because this was the language they spoke at home in the day, the Jews. They read the Bible in Hebrew, but they spoke to one another in Aramaic. This would have been the most intimate kind of thing to do. Jesus is personal. He speaks to us where uh, we are most comfortable. And Perhaps many of you who are Christians today, God saved you 
when you heard the gospel through your mother tongue, through your through the original language. And uh, the amazing thing is, remember, the gospel of Mark is written to Roman Gentiles. <laughs> what language is Mark written in? He didn't write it in Hebrew and translate it to Greek. God gave it directly to them in their language, in Greek. And to us today, we have a translation, the English translation, which we can read and understand. Then in verse 42, immediately, in the span of seconds, she is up and alive as if nothing happened. She opens her eyes and think about this. The first person she sees is actually Jesus himself. Then she looks around, she probably saw her parents. Then she saw these three men, the Jesus' disciples. And that's also uh, forward-looking. When Christians, when God uh, saves us and we we die and we go to heaven, the first thing we do when that happens, when we open our eyes to is we'll see Jesus face to face. And let's continue looking on. Twelve years, uh, in verse 42, it says, For she was twelve years old. It seems like a little detail, but remember again, where did the twelve years show up? Earlier in the passage, when the woman who was bleeding for 12 whole years, think about this, perhaps Jesus had a lesson to teach Jairus. While Jairus was, Jesus, please come touch my daughter so that she would be well. And then all of a sudden, this interruption, seemingly an interruption comes in from the bleeding woman. And not only does she cause the whole Jesus to stop, but she spends the next who knows how long maybe hours, sharing her testimony, sharing of how she was unclean, sharing of how she was bleeding for 12 years. All the while, Jairus must have been thinking, Jesus, we need to go. My daughter is about to die. But if this woman had to suffer 12 years in God's perfect time to be healed, then, hey, perhaps Jairus, you can learn to have compassion on others and understand too, you can wait a couple of hours because... I'm still in control. This was not a surprise to Jesus. Almost as if nothing else matters. This shows us Jesus' compassion. Twelve years, it's not by coincidence, it's not by chance or luck. God is in control, and because Jesus is God, he's in perfect control. Imagine if the woman showed up the day before or the day after. They would have missed one another. But this little detail, Marcus should remind us again of who is in control, Jesus. And immediately they were completely astounded. They must have been so happy and yet so surprised. No one's ever seen something, see something like this. So what do you do when you see a miracle? What do you do when you see something amazing happen? You want to go tell everyone. You want to tell the world. And what does Jesus say in verse 43? Keep it quiet. He gave them strict orders that no one should know about this. And he said that some food should be given to her to eat. Why should no one know about this? Think about this. Well, it's because, remember, in God's time, this was not the right time for others to know about this miracle. But today, we do. And again, how will you respond to the truths that you heard? But at the time, perhaps Jesus was protecting the family, protecting the girl. How, how would it be like to go through school and be known as the girl who was, who was raised from the dead? Your life would probably be a lot, very different. And also protecting the family. Remember when Jesus in the other Gospels, when Jesus did decide to make a resurrection public, he raised Lazarus from the dead. What did, what did the Jewish leaders want to do to Lazarus? They wanted to, to kill Lazarus because on the testimony of Lazarus, many people were coming to the faith. So Jesus also perhaps wanted to protect his family. It wasn't the right time, but on Jesus' time, it will be the right time. I want you to notice throughout this passage, when we read, uh, studied verses 21 to verse 43, when Jairus was first introduced in verse 22, and one of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up. When someone is named in the Bible, there it's very important. This is someone memorable, and even this would be someone known to the Mark's audience. Jairus, the synagogue official, probably synagogue official no more. We see that things didn't happen on Jairus' time, Come, save my daughter. Things didn't happen on the woman's time. Please, I want to be healed. But for 12 whole years, healing did not come to her. But everything comes together on God's time, on Jesus' time. And 
we see that uh, today is the right time. Again, mm -hmm. today we have the privilege of stepping into that same room as the disciples, as the girl's parents, as Jesus himself. We get to see Jesus raising the girl from the dead. And the question is, what are you going to do with the knowledge that you have, with the information you have? Just to kind of close up, want to give some things. Do we see Jesus' compassion in verse 43? He said that some food should be given to her to eat. Again, this is a girl who was died of an illness. And for, for a while, she probably did not eat food. He knew what she needed. He, he has compassion. But it may also be to show us Jesus' main reason for coming to the earth was not to feed us. Was not to even raise us from the dead. He didn't just come to he when he raised her from the dead. He could also gave her a full stomach, correct? Like a, not made her not hungry. But it may be to show us that his first reason for coming is to meet our spiritual needs. When every person has a problem of sin. We're all enemies of God from the moment we were born. We are all born. We live our own lives and. We only care about ourselves and don't even think about God and His Word, and and because of that, God deserves uh, God deserves to have us all separated from Him for all times. But He gave us His Son Jesus, His only Son, who is perfectly God and perfectly man, who came and lived a perfect life that we should have lived, and He died on the cross, paying the penalty for sin that we should have taken on ourselves. And he rose from the dead himself. He didn't need anyone else to raise him from the dead. He rose from the dead himself to show that he is God. He is in control. We see that he defeated Satan in Mark chapter 1. He, he defeated demons in the, in the chapters. And he also defeated sin uh, on the cross. And here we see he defeated death. That's all the problems that we have in, uh, in mankind. And Jesus defeated them all. So who do you trust in? Do you trust in yourselves? Do you trust in what the world has to say? And the world today is telling you Christianity is false. Jesus is not God. He's just a man. Or maybe he didn't even exist. But God's word, he, t he tells us, do not be afraid. Only believe my words. So spend the time in God's word and the Bible to get to know him as he should be known and worshipped. Let us pray. <laughs> Our Father in heaven, thank you for tonight where you allow us to study this passage. And it's a wonderful, rich passage showing us so many beautiful things. Seeing Jesus' compassion, seeing his love for Jairus, for the, for the bleeding woman, for Jairus' family, for the little girl. And we pray that you would help us to apply the truths that we learned today. Father, thank you for the food we're about to eat and even the time of fellowship. Would you help us to speak and care for one another and to remind one another again of what is true what is love and what is just and that is your word that is who you are your son jesus christ thank you again father for this time we can spend in your word we love you and we pray and ask all this in your son jesus name amen so we do have one more song for worship let's stand and sing this